Jan. Good morning. We're back. Hello. <laughs> so this is the trauma and bleeding module of EM Cert Module Mastery. And for all of you on this, you most likely have already taken at least one of these modules. So you have a general gist of what this is, this new system of how we stay certified, taking these modules, there are nine of them, that we have to take a certain number during our five year now recertification process. One of the things about these modules to know, and the most of you who've done this know this already, is the modules themselves are now open book. And the timing on these gives you plenty of time. Don't worry about timing. Timing turns out not to be the issue with these things. I think the thing is just to make your time efficient is to know that it is open book. And these slides are meant to help you have pretty much everything that we anticipate they might put in that module to ask you a question about. Now, one of the things to know is we are not prescient. Um, we don't exactly know what's going to be out there. So that you might want to have a few other things available while you're taking the test that you go to for your trauma and bleeding resources, whatever. And, and it covers a gigantic range of things in this. We'll talk about it. But make sure you have open if you use sort of an online thing like up to date or if you use a, an online textbook or if you use these, have these slides. They're searchable, so in the real time you can search them. But find something that you have to kind of let you tap more than one resource on these things because it's open book to take these things. So that's wonderful. The other thing to keep open while you're taking any of these modules is that part of all of the modules are the key advances. So what you want to do with the key advances, we have a separate set of slides for those, so have those available as well. They come with this module. But know that you should also either have open on your desktop or better yet, print out the summaries on the ABEM website of the key advances. They print, it's a one or two page summary. And honestly, it's a freebie 10 questions. The 10 questions that they ask on these key advances come straight out of those. And honestly, as long as you have those, you're going to have 10 locked in answers for the most part. So between our key advances slides, the key advances preferably printed out on your on your on your real table with real paper that you can flip through and look at. You'll get some freebie sort of answers on those. Those are pretty straightforward. The other 40 questions in these come strictly from trauma and bleeding from the ABEM standpoint. Now thank you, thank you, ABEM, for yes. letting it be open book. And yes. yeah, yeah, that part's good. That part's gifts. really good. The thing that you'll, you may find that no, what's nice as well is that these are done like our jobs. This, these are done in clinical settings. Almost all of these, there, there's no, you know, what's the most likely cause, uh, you know, in, the, in a textbook version. It's like in this particular patient, what's the most best, next best test, the most likely cause, the consultant you should call, those sorts of things are in this thing. It's real life. Um, the, the things that we've been hearing that people get frustrated about is it may not be your real life. It may be ABEM's version of real mm -hmm. life. And we'll try to, as we go through this module, tell you where those little bits and pieces may come yeah. up. Um, because that definitely comes up with all things yeah. ABEM. It just seems to filter exactly. in. You know yeah. that from the oral exams. ABEM general is different than where you work. Than where you work, <laughs> exactly. So this, so sit back and relax. This is a gigantic topic. Trauma, it includes all kinds of things. Trauma and bleeding. Anything that bleeds and anything that can be traumatized. So it's a gigantic group. It's kind of the fun stuff, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. It's what we all kind of really love yeah. about what we do. So that Part's good. But many of you may not work at a trauma center or have yes. it in a long time. So we hope this is a fun review. Maybe it takes you back to your residency days. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and you can do this in bits and pieces. So this is going to be many hours long, this particular module. So so if you're a if you're a, you're a sit down and do it all at once kind of person, have at it. But go ahead and just pick and choose. You know, these are all divided into subsections. So you can like go to the ortho section, go to the peds ortho section. You can go to bits and pieces. So study this as you will and know that again, you can have it up while you're taking the exam and it's infinitely searchable. So hopefully it will help you while you're actually taking the exam. So that's the background. Yes. Let's get going. Trauma and bleeding. So we're going to start with just an overview of trauma, just an overview of the general things that have to do with trauma. And we know that trauma has been sort of codified. It's been made algorithmic by ATLS. So an ATLS has done this in sort of two layers of evaluating a patient. The first thing we want to do is a super rapid overview. You know, basically, are they dead or not? It <laughs> makes a difference to know. Uh, just a basically stable, unstable, or dead. Basically, those are, those are the sort of major initial three categories. But then you do your primary survey. And the primary survey is the things that we all remember from learning ATLS. It's airway, breathing, circulation. What I learned is disability, yeah. which is actually sort of the neurologic function. And then examination of everything, make them naked. And exposure. Exposure. Mm -hmm. So that's the A, B, C, D, E. So that's the initial primary survey. In that, after that primary survey, you're going to decide one of three things. Either wow, red line to the OR, major sick, 
or not redline, let's do a secondary survey and we're gonna then have some time to kind of jiggle through and figure out what's that. And the secondary survey is the detailed head to toe. And this is the thing where you know, there's always, always somebody who wants to look at the pupils on the initial evaluation of somebody, that's not in the primary survey, that's in the secondary survey. So that is really the head to toe, getting a little bit of history, all that happens in the secondary survey, and then you're gonna decide, oh yeah, really sick to the OR, or no, let's get some tests, or well, now we're just gonna hang out and watch this person. So that, and to be honest, this has been a really nice systematic way we can all learn yeah. to approach trauma. Yeah, uh, an examination of the abdomen, not in the primary survey. No. Exa you know, seeing if the pelvis is stable, not in the primary no, survey. No, tempting, Those things but are don't. All, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those things wait because yes. the light you will find the life threats and take care of the life threats yes. in that primary survey, exactly. which is the key. That's right? what it's designed for. Keep them alive and then go from there. So that's yeah. the, and we know this, and a lot of us are certified yep. in this, have Absolutely. to be certified in this and get cranky about it, but this is the ATLS survey. Now, the initial approach, that initial idea of, you know, are they stable, unstable, dying, or dead, that initial approach, what we really want to do in that very first layer is identify something we can fix right now, where it's going to really change saving somebody's life right now. And the things we're going to identify with the sort of A, B, C, D, E part of the primary survey are airway obstruction, tension pneumo, massive hemorrhage that we need to take care of, especially external, um, open pneumo, flail chest, and cardiac tamponade. Those are the things that we theoretically can intervene right now and buy time to get the patient now uh, evaluated further or to the operating room. So Jan, why don't you start with the airway stuff, the A part? Yeah, so this is obviously a very important part of the primary survey because it's one of the real life threats. Like no matter what else is happening with them, if their airway is going to go bad, it's going to go bad quick and everything's going to go downhill. So of course, when we're talking about trauma and we're assessing an airway, C-spine control is obviously very much on the list and can create a, a tougher airway. We know that going into it. Now, when do you intubate somebody? Well, c traditionally we teach that if your GCS is less than eight, you intubate. The other part of trauma is when somebody's really out of control, we also tend to go for intubation because we get gonna have to need, we need the CTs or they're going to the OR. There's a lot of reasons at that point. Where that they, they can might exacerbate their Ill exactly. injury. So yeah. danger to themselves mostly. So if we are gonna take the airway, we're gonna do RSI, of course, and we're gonna be stabilizing the C-spine. We That is how we have to approach the, the airway and trauma because we have an undifferentiated patient with potential injuries. Nexus criteria helps us, right? We can go through, as long as they're not intoxicated, they don't have distracting injury, all of the things, we can examine their midline to see if there's midline tenderness, we can look for neuro deficits, we have to assess them from the Nexus standpoint. So remember that these days, you know, we and if you, if you pass Nexus, if you don't have any of those things and you qualify, then you don't need C-spine x-rays. That's what Nexus was designed to actually answer the question, right. do they need C-spine x-rays? Now, the most common obstruction in a traumatic airway is gonna be the tongue because they're in a C-spine, they're laying flat. So remember that, that if you're, you're seeing an obstructed airway, remember to address that. That might jaw be lift. a jaw, exactly. It could just be a maneuver to try to she reposition things. Yeah. Um, often that's all it takes too. That's often the answer to the problem. Um, and then if you're thinking about nasotracheal intubation in trauma, remember that there are a couple contraindications. Certainly if you have facial trauma, basilar skull fractured, or they're not breathing at all, because usually they're, cords are opening and closing in nasotracheal intubation. Um, those are things that would Yeah, and honestly, most of us don't do nasotracheal. Yeah, it's really kind of fallen yeah. by the I, wayside. I like it still because I'm old and it was fun yeah. back in the day. But honestly, with videoscopes and DLs and things, we just don't really do them anymore. That's Plus in right. trauma, it's just not the most fabulous idea. No, there's usually burritos and yes. things that are coming up <laughs> our way. Um, okay, what about breathing? As we're moving through our primary survey, so we've talked about airway. We're kind of assessing the airway for um, obstruction. We're preparing for RSI. Then we're looking on to breathing. So now we're moving on to the chest and we're looking to see what we're dealing with. Now, if we see a sucking chest wound, I've always loved that term, sucking chest wound. It'll and it come sometimes up, it'll sounds come like that. Yeah, no. Once in a while it really does, it's like, oh, yeah. that's good. Yeah. Then we're gonna put an occlusive dressing and you see that illustrated here. Now, if they've been tubed, remember that if there's some breathing issues, you can think about what's happening here. Do I, need, do I, ha do I have a, a um, tube that's gone in too deep? Do I need to reposition that tube? That could be a problem. If I'm detecting that there's a pneumothorax, especially a tension pneumothorax, because I'm still in the primary survey and I'm trying to assess it right now, I'm gonna decompress that, new, that pneumothorax. And that may be a needle, depending on where I am and what my resources are. It may be a quick chest tube, depending on where I am and what my resources are. Remember that if you have a hemothorax that comes out initially at greater than 1500 is the official guideline, that is somebody who has massive hemorrhage in their chest and would be someone who's a candidate for a thoracotomy. 
That well, may not be though an ER thoracotomy. Exactly. That's I was going to say that may be something that you need. That's not, mm -hmm. I'm not talking about, you know. I mean, that person <laughs> may be chatting with you and I'm not about yes. to rip their chest no. open in the ER. So that's somebody that though. Yes. Would be may expedited to the OR. Red line to the OR. Right. For an operative thoracotomy. Mm -hmm. Um, and as we move through the primary survey, remember that bag valve mask ventilation is obviously a temporizing measure. And that may be by itself, or it may be in conjunction with other devices like an NP airway and OP airway, depending on what the situation is. Right. So that's how you're going to temporize in that moment. Diane, you're going to talk about yeah, circulation. Yeah, then we need to go to the C, right? So ABCs, the C is circulation. And we know IV access is key. And this is actually something that's kind of ripe for questioning, yeah. right? Like what IV access should you get? And the reality is too large bore short Antecubital IVs can dump in a ton of fluid fast. And, it, and it's a tempting thing to say, oh no, we'll get the central line. It's never faster in a no. central line unless it has a pump that puts it through there. So the reality is IV access is key. Two big large bore uh, you know, AC lines are perfect. Other lines are fine. If you have no access at all, you can try an IO. Um, in fact, a lot of people kind of default to that. It's not the best line in trauma, but if you have to get something, that's fine. And know that what we're trying to do here is kind of assess blood volume. What we're doing during the circulation status of this is knowing that certain injuries can bleed a lot and we don't know it. Like a femur can bleed basically a fifth of your blood volume into your leg. A pelvic fracture can bleed two fifths of your blood, blood volume sort of somewhere down there in the pelvic area. So we know that, that we need to have access because even injuries that aren't causing massive obvious bleeding like rupturing a spleen or a, the laceration of an artery can cause a lot of problems with circulation. So our goal here is to keep in mind that we need to really get something, some access to this and significant hemorrhage, especially in young healthy adults, can be hidden. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it, we see this all the time. They look okay, they look okay, and then they crash and burn because they have really a lot of reserve, and we don't really see it until things really go bad. Now, we know that we have certain clues in our circulation. One of the reasons we check capillary refill is this: the, is people start to clamp down when they end up losing some blood volume. So they clamp down, so their refill decreases. Now, we know that's not a perfect measure. My, I'm freezing right now. I'm sure my capillary refill looks like I should be you know, like resuscitated. <laughs> but the reality is that, that cap refill is one measure. We also know pulse pressure narrows yes. as you lose blood volume. And that's actually kind of a fun, you're kind of a smart person. Look at it. So if ABEM General gives you vital signs that show a pulse pressure of only 20. Yeah. You know, the blood pressure is 110 over 90. Yeah. Ooh, that's, that's kind scary, of scary. Yeah. Um, and the more blood volume you lose, of course, your blood pressure finally, finally it gives up the ghost and says, I'm done. We, our first thing is always crystalloid. Um, I'll, it's not at all uncommon in trauma, though, to quickly transition to blood. But the first thing is to at least dump in something to fill the tank. So isotonic crystalloid of some sort. And if you need blood, you can use whole blood or packed cells. I think most of us start with packed cells. And the key, if, you, if you're in that resuscitation phase, and it's like, wow, we need to give blood to this person, you can give O negative to everybody, O positive to men, if you just need it right this minute. If you have time to get type specific, that's better. That takes a little time, 10 to 15 minutes or so. And the best, of course, is typed and crossed blood. That takes about an hour. So a lot of this depends on the urgency of the timing that you really need to have this done. So we've got the A, B, C. Mm -hmm. The D part, or N in this particular initial thing, is, the, is to do a neurologic exam. Now the thing about brief, the neurologic brief. Exam. This is the this is not the ones we'll talk about in a second. Yes. This is the are they a, a awake? Can they yes. talk to me? Can they move? I mean, that's basically it. Yeah. And the Glasgow Coma Scale, I think a lot of us have gotten, depending how you learn this, it used to be, it initially was taught as like four, six, five is normal, which means the order was alphabetical by, by what you're testing. This is in order by the total number of points you can get for each. The key to, to, to if it has a decrement, is explain where it is. You know, E4, V5, M6 is normal. And that's one way to report it. But the GCS again here is just a very superficial neurologic, are they breathing? Can they talk to me? Can they move? Kind of thing. Yep. Basically, that's, that's it. Yes. The secondary survey is where we get into the more details. And this is what, what we mentioned in the beginning. The primary is just to get the big, broad brush. What's the life threat? What can I fix? Well, how can I get things started? Airway issues, blah, you know, circulation issues. Now, I'm going to go look for all the details. Now, I'm going to really care about that scaphoid fracture. Now, I am going to care that they have a zygoma fracture. Now, I'm going to look at those pupils. So it's a compulsive head-to-toe exam. And I can't emphasize enough compulsive. Um, we all get kind of like squirrel, squirrel. You know, ooh, look, here's a finding over here. And yeah. don't look over there. So a very compulsive head to toe is, is uh, very important here. And I think sometimes that gets overlooked. And if you need to do a tertiary survey eventually and go back and do all of it, that's fine. But please get it all done at some point. Yeah. This is where we do more of a history. And it's the ample history. Are you allergic to anything? What medicines are you taking? What's your past medical history? What, when was your last meal? And what happened around the, the events around the injury? So that's your ample history. And if the patient's talking to you, they tell you. If not, you get 
other people around that maybe have, have seen it or know something about the patient. And then you all have a powwow. Like, what do we do now? What imaging do we do? What labs do we send? What consultants do we need? You know, what do we do now? So that's basically, if the patient's stable enough not to get redlined initially, now you're deciding all of that at the end of the secondary survey. Absolutely. Now this next topic is about hemorrhagic shock, and this is very testable. Because oh, imagine, yeah. it's very easy to write questions asking you in this type of hemorrhagic shock, what percentage blood loss? Is it what you think about as you're resuscitating a patient? No, but it's like a very testable thing, and it's it reflects your underlying a knowledge about the physiology of what's going on. So remember that hemorrhagic shock is divided into different classes depending on what percentage of your blood loss you have you have lost. So class one is when you've lost up to 15%, and you know in that point you don't see a lot of vital sign changes. As you move on to class two, you've lost a little more blood, you're up to 30%, and now you're starting to see a little something. Your heart rate started to ju jump up, your blood pressure still stays normal. There's some sign that there's abnormality with your heart rate, but the blood pressure is still normal. And maybe they're getting a little more anxious, and at that point we're still talking about pretty mild blood loss, their pulse has jumped up. Now we move to class three. Now we're into 30 to 40%. Now we're really talking about shock. We're talking about dumping your pressure. We're talking about not perfusing, getting altered mental status. And then we get to class four, which is what they call pre-terminal, meaning that your heart rate is sky high, your blood pressure is in the tank. You're now like fully confused and you know this is someone who needs blood. So understanding the progression through these things and in a person who is a classic normal person who's not beta blocked, who's mm -hmm. not this or that, you know, they would follow this progression. And so right. understanding that basic physiology, they want you to know. And the testable part of this would be in this kind of exam is they would give you, for instance, especially the three part questions where they start with one, one case, one question on a case, and then they expand it to the next question on a case. The transition, they may ask you what's the next, you know, first best thing to do in question one. In question two, they may change the vital signs and want you to recognize that the patient has now gone into a place where they are in hemorrhagic shock, say class too, where their pulse pressure is now smaller and their pulse is up a little bit, and they're going to want you to recognize that. That's how they'll write it into these kinds of questions, is in a clinical scenario that they expect you to recognize yeah. that someone is actually getting worse. Absolutely. So when someone comes in in full cardiac arrest, they've had a trauma, obviously what's on the table is an ED thoracotomy. And the absolute indication when you would do it, the best case scenario where it might actually have benefit is someone who's suffered a penetrating chest wound, right? Um, and they've had some gunshot wound or stab wound to the chest with something that can be fixed quickly and can resu be resuscitated. Now, obviously, if they've had some signs of life in the field, whether it was pre-hospital or what you saw in the department, and there was some evidence of cardiac activity not too long ago, go then and that's something we would see on our ultrasound and the ed like that is the best case yeah. scenario that that's is like someone that has a chance yeah. right everybody gets excited because yeah. you really might make a difference yeah that is the case that is the classic indication for ed thoracotomy now successful yeah. successful that has a chance mm -hmm. is that the t only time we do it <laughs> no so there are more liberal indications, right? People who come in with more blunt trauma in general, but had some cardiac activity and lost their signs of life in the ED, the thought is, well, if I th do the thoracotomy and I can get their aorta clamped, maybe I can buy myself some time to get to the OR and fix something. That's a more liberal indication. Prognosis is still pretty poor. And blunt chest trauma, again, like it's not penetrating, but it's blunt, and they've got loss of vital signs in the ED, and you know, what are we going to do next? And yeah. sometimes these are decisions that are made because you feel like, you know, I've got to do something. Here's a young person who suffered this dynamic trauma. Maybe there's something we can do. Isn't it worth trying? And especially if you're in a trauma center, those things are going to be more liberalized. But know that right. there really is one category that truly yeah. is and, a, a and I don't think on an exam they would take you here because I don't honestly, so. this is it, it's, this is a, a tough enough decision in trauma centers. And actually, in trauma centers, we have a different overlay of we get dinged actually if we do thoracotomies that really aren't okay by the American College of Surgeons. So, yeah. so there, so part of this is I don't think it's a testable thing. And in your in real life, do not do one of these if you have no backup anywhere. That's for sure true. Yeah. I, the only question I could see them asking is giving you a scenario of the classic yeah. indication, like here's the person they were stabbed in the chest, they arrived at your ED, you did an ultrasound there was activity and then all of a sudden they crash and they burn and they lose their vitals like what would you do next yeah the answer would be thoracotomy. exactly yeah. exactly all right so if you're going to do one, maybe we'll know a little bit about the procedure. If you're going to actually, if, you have, if it's been a while, remember that you do an incision down the, the, the side of the body at the fifth intercostal space. You're trying to get to the pericardium to open it, and you're trying to drain the blood. That's really where we're going. And where you want to go, you see in the picture uh, on the right, which is with your, with your uh, scissors, you want to just go along um, the right anterior to the phrenic nerve. So which you is really obvious, bag by that. the way. When yes. you look in there, you see it. You see this cord kind of coming like, down. It's like, oh, oh, that's what it looks like. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now
Now, because what's really in the front of the chest is the right side of the heart, the right ventricle, right atrium, that is the area that's most commonly injured. They could ask you that, like what is the most common injury pattern? Mm -hmm. That's because that's what lies right there anteriorly. So that's really where you're going. Right, and that thoracotomy actually should go further down. Yeah, that is not far that enough that's down. That's not far enough yeah. down. It and should that go person to the bed. looks very black inside. That, that that's like a like smoker's a, lung. Yeah, I, I was going to say, that's somebody who works like the coal mines <laughs> yeah, or something. That's a like, really that's weird Not good. Slide. Yeah. All right, another area that I find really fascinating that we don't see very often, but is again kind of testable, is blast injuries, right? Many of us haven't ever seen someone who really had a true blast injury. And it's important to know the physiology of blast injuries, that there's a primary injury, a secondary, and a tertiary, and mm -hmm. a quaternary phase of what happens in a blast injury. So the first things that happen when there's a blast, which is a force that comes at you, is that you have the wave, the wave of the blast, and it comes at you and it damages your tissue, right? It perfectly your EM, your TM. It can cause damage to your air and fluid filled organs. Your lungs, right, can pop. Your ears, as I mentioned, your eye, your brain, your abdomen, those are the things. And the secondary thing is as the blast happens, now you have things flying at you and there's projectiles. So as the blast propels various things at you, then you get the secondary blast injury. And this is actually the highest cause of mortality, the shrapnel that shreds you, the thing that cuts you in some, you know, terrible way. These are also, they're terrible to talk about. Oh, oh God. I'm just like even saying it out loud. Like, 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 you know, and these can because they come with such force, you can have a very small entry wound, but really there's such propulsion with it, it can do a lot of damage yeah. once it enters the tissue. And then there's the tertiary injury, which is from the blast and the force itself, the wind that comes with it. Now I'm blown into a wall and I suffer injury from that, something like that, or the collapse of the building on the body. And then sort of beyond that, what happens next is kind of in the quaternary category. But there are definitely these three mechanical things that can happen along the path of a blast injury that we have to know about and how that injury happened, which right. phase of the blast injury it came with. Yeah, I just watched a, a movie that just came out, one of those sort of latest Bond equivalents, yeah. and there's a scene where he just com gets completely blasted. And and I know that we've all gotten kind of like, oh, whatever, you know, just, a, but they did a good job with him not being able to hear yes. afterwards. They played it like he could not hear, which gave you an idea. But, and I also find all these movies a little, it makes me really edgy because I know what happens for real, like yeah. in those things. It's like, oh, yeah. yeah. So people are familiar with them, at least in movies. We're familiar with them for real. Yeah. This is one of those kind of walks you through a little more detail about blast injuries or reminds you in the little box the summary of the primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. And then it kind of goes through all the specifics that are kind of unique to blast injuries um, about what you want to remember. And it goes through like, you know, that there's a, do you, have, do you need a tourniquet? And what about the head injuries? And, you know, goes through all the different specifics. You see the little guy, he's got like no leg. Yeah, and he's got tourniquets there. And ooh, you know, right, it's just right. like. This is sort of a lot of wartime people. Those of you who are veterans who went overseas may yeah. be very, familiar with all of this, especially if you were a, a, a medical provider overseas, you're very familiar with all of these injuries. I think domestically, we worry about this with domestic violence, uh, domestic terrorism in particular. So this is something that we certainly could see in our practices, depending what happens in our environment. Yeah. The other thing that we definitely can see in our practices is gunshot wounds. And we see tons and tons and tons of these. And honestly, I didn't know anything really about them in my life. I'm not particularly someone who is familiar with guns, but I know a lot about what can happen to a body when a, when a bullet hits them from anything from a shotgun with birdshot to a shotgun with buckshot to any different kind of bullets, including the cop killer bullets, all of them we've seen in our practice if you work in an, in an inner city urban sort of trauma center, you see these things. So this is actually a summary of just the kinds of injuries that can happen and the kinds of bullet things. But I think the thing to take home from this particular slide is that what you see on the outside may have absolutely nothing to do with what's happening on the inside. There's a hue and a yaw and a, what happens to the bullets inside your tissue. Mm. And it can, it can look teeny on the outside and cause a gigantic cavern on the inside. It's the ones that shatter on the ends and it can, it can spin and cause shredding. And so there's a lot of things that can happen inside um, with a gunshot wound. So we just know that it is always something, especially if it's an area where it can kill you. We'll talk about those where it can kill you very easily. Um, we worry about the things that might have happened beyond what we can actually see at the surface. So gunshot wounds are often kind of hidden and the bullets take weird trajectories. And so it just becomes a, a big sort of super uber careful thing to deal with when it deal, you deal with gunshot wounds. And gunshot wounds in mass casualties, um, too many of our colleagues have had to deal with this, where there have been mass casualty guns, gunshot events. You know, The thing in Las Vegas was just devastating. I have a family member who was involved in a mass casualty incident where 12 people were killed. And so this is something that we see in our jobs. And I think the thing for us is the idea of a mass casualty is you save who you can save 
first. Um, you have to make some decisions on triaging, and that's where all the different triage coding things happens. But the key here is if there is a mass casualty incident, and say they br say a bunch of cars just show up at your emergency department with 20 different victims all at once, you're going to first make sure their airways are okay. You're going to undo attention if attention is happening. Because again, we're it's like the primary survey. It's the thing I can fix right now. I'm going to stop any external bleeding that I can do. Those are the things I'm going to absolutely run around and do like a crazy person to try to keep people alive till I can assess more. And I know the things that are going to be the most lethal are going to be things in the in the thorax and the chest, basically the box here. Head Bad head injuries are not usually things you can save mm -hmm. in a mass casualty incident, but you can something that's in the box. So those are the people that get priority. So bad head injuries, no. Extremities, wait. You know, if it's bleeding, fix it first and then let it sit and then you're going to go to the to the box that basically and tourniquets are vital this is where we've gotten really good at our tourniquets Absolutely. you know this is where wartime brought it to domestic practice and we really are very good at taking care of extremities that might bleed someone to death again the goal is stop the bleeding make sure if there's a wound it doesn't get contaminated if possible don't have anybody get further injured if you can save that preventing ischemia if you can of, a, of an extremity but mainly it's stop the bleeding if it's stoppable get that airway open get rid of that tension and focus on the thorax, thorax and abdomen. Speaking of extremities, if you do have a gunshot wound of the extremity, usually this is not a big deal, but it can be. It just depends on what it hit, of course, right? What are we worried about when it goes into an extremity? Well, certainly there's nerves there. There's arteries there, which we are concerned about. And there can be bones in the way as well. Now, sometimes these gunshot wounds go through and there's really not much that's like, involved. Wow. I mean, yeah, like they're very, very lucky. But remember that compartment syndrome can develop, right? Obviously, these come, things come in with force. There's going to be swelling that happens over time. So there has to be a concern for that. Many of our hospitals have some kind of protocol for who sees these outpatient. You know, when you do determine that it's not life threatening and you need to kind of refer them, you know, what are you going to do? And so you go through these things, you, this gunshot wound management protocol, where you look at things that are low velocity wounds and how old it is and what kind, or whether it's low or high velocity and what are the priorities with those types of injuries. And so you see that debridement is a big part of it, irrigation. So we're worried about the infectious nature of these types of things. If there's a fracture, we're going to stabilize it. And then there might be wound closure determinants that depend on what kind of wound it is and how when the presentation is. Right, and this is something they could theoretically test on. I honestly think if I were if I were an ABM item writer, the flame I would be drifting toward as the moth uh, would be compartment syndrome. So one of the things to keep in mind is they may be asking you a question of somebody who had a minor gunshot injury yesterday who comes yeah. in now with pain out of proportion. And your job is to recognize that that is one of the presentations of compartment syndrome and pursue that, not infection, not, you know, d yeah. if, it, if it fits with pain out of proportion, don't expect the distal pulses or neur neurologic exam to be changed yet. That's late for that to happen. Don't expect it to be pulseless. That's late. It's pain out of proportion in this kind of injury. And that's something that's infinitely testable. Yeah. One option that you have for a really bad extremity bleeding is Foley catheters. And so if you have um, a, 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 you know, an, a situation where you can use this type of technique, go right ahead. Um, somebody who's in shock and you have the opportunity to try to tamponade that bleeding, a Foley catheter might be an option for you. So I don't think they're gonna, probably going to ask about no, that, but it's good no. to know. Like as you're reviewing this topic, just remember. Yes. Well, the other thing is Reboas, which are something that yes. you know, the, basically they put the, the catheter in the femoral artery up and feed it up to prevent v vascular supply going distally yeah. um, it's sort of like a through the through the groin version of an open thoracotomy it's a yes. similar idea that w they won't test on but they may want you to know it exists um, because it is now something that I think at least in trauma centers is kind of it's not de rigueur but it's around yeah. so and it would just be yeah. aware of that too yeah now tourniquets, as we've mentioned, are you know very much in fashion up front. There's the whole stop the bleed campaign. This is a really big deal. We know that this can prevent death, so therefore let's focus on it. Let's educate people how to use them. And certainly, you know, when someone's had penetrating trauma and they is in the extremity in particular, and they have uncontrolled hemorrhage that can't be dealt with immediately, a tourniquet can absolutely be life threat, life saving. So having a low threshold to put this on should be a very big first choice and emphasis. So it should be something you do early. It's better to be right and get it on. I mean, it's better just to be safe and get it on there. And then you want to make sure that it's tight enough. That's one thing that people, they tend to like kind of shy away because it seems so tight. But yes, you want to make it tight enough to completely obliterate the blood flow that's coming into that extremity so, you're pr so that you can prevent the hemorrhage. And if you need a second tourniquet, go right ahead and do that. That's mm -hmm. something that you can do. It's nice to write on the tourniquet or make note of when the time that yeah. it was placed because you've now created ischemia in a limb that you know that's only so much time that you can right. leave that 
that there without doing damage. So, you know, you want to note when it was placed and you want to be very careful not to loosen this tourniquet that's been applied no matter how much pain the person's in because this may be something that's saving their life. So treat the pain, don't loosen the tourniquet. Right, this is where the consultant comes in yeah. and you all do this together yes. in a controlled setting. Yeah, you don't just loosen it just to kind of see what happens. Yeah, like, you know? let's check it out. No. <laughs> yeah, not a great idea. Mm -hmm. You you learn you learn that the hard way. Yeah, I, think. I mean, that's just the kind of thing. <laughs> I think yeah. that's true. Yeah, now there are some <laughs> other options for bad extremity bleeding. Again, these are things we've learned mostly from military research that there's there are different types of hemostatic gauze, gauze that's been impregnated with different types of uh, materials to help stop the bleeding as well. Like the ketosand or kaolin, these yeah. are very interesting things. And it's really clever. Yeah, it's very, very cool. And so, you know, basically if you put in the hemostatic gauze, it will sort of deploy these different chemicals and materials to stop the bleeding, which is which is pretty awesome. So you kind of pack it in and you kind of push it in there and give it a little, a little pressure. And, um, you know, it's not comfortable. It's going to make the patient to be in more pain. But again, like this is something, if I'm trying to save your life, I'm going to do what's well, right. Well, especially things like this. So this yeah. is, it, muscle bleeding can be really extensive if a big amount of muscle has been like yeah. torn and shredded. Yeah. And it really is kind of amazing. This isn't something that every ER has no. by any stretch. It's just think about it as something like the, the little gels we use for like your tiny little bleeds that won't stop. This is a bigger version of the same. Yeah. Um, but know that it is out there and I don't know if they would test about it but they may want yeah. you to know about this yeah that you put um, it in and it expands yeah, it expands can, yeah it's yeah. kind of kind pretty of, cool it is cool yeah it's pretty amazing yes